Hello, everyone. I'm Charlene Oldham from Maplewood Public Library in Maplewood, Missouri. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator for the library, and it is seven o'clock. We already have several attendees um, who have signed on, so I will go ahead and get this event started. Um, just a few housekeeping things before I introduce Mark. Um, you can log your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen um, where it says Q&A and the chat is also active. However, um, the Q&A screen is the one I'll be monitoring for questions to pose to Mark um, during the Q&A period. Uh, since we do have several uh, folks signed up tonight. We might not get to every question. However, Mark has been kind enough to um, let me know that I can um, collect all the questions and pass them on, and we will um, pass on answers to all those questions we don't get to um, in the follow-up emails to this presentation. Um, so with that, I will uh, introduce Mark and we will get started. Um, so Mark H.X. Glenshaw is an award-winning naturalist who has closely observed and documented the lives of great horned owls in Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri since December 2005. He shares his work on his blog, Forest Park Owls, which you can find at forestparkowls.blogspot.com. The owls and his work with them have received regular coverage from local and regional media outlets spanning the spectrum of TV, radio, print, and web. Mark does extensive outreach work with the owls. He leads dozens of owl prowls each year in Forest Park. He also gives scores of talks each year across Missouri and Illinois and beyond to a wide range of different organizations and institutions. He was awarded citizen, the Citizen Scientist Award by the Academy of Science St. Louis in 2006. Mark is a certi certified interpretive guide, a certified Missouri master naturalist, and a volunteer for Forest Park Forever. A native of Washington, D.C., and the son of an American mother and South African father, Mark is a dual citizen of both nations. His work or Mark has his bachelor's degree in history with a minor in communications and journalism from Washington University in St. Louis. And when he's not studying owls, he works with Font he works at Fontbonne University, where he's the manager of university services. Mark's talk, How to Find an Owl in Your Neighborhood, will show which owls you are most likely to see or hear how to look for them, what to listen for, and the importance of research and collaboration. And with that, I will hand it off to Mark. And if he could be so kind as to correct his title, um, his professional job title, I think I botched it. So apologies and handing it off to Mark. Thank you, Charlene. You did just fine. I, yes, I'm the manager of university services. And thank you, Charlene, for that very warm introduction. And I really want to thank Charlene and all of her colleagues at the Maplewood Public Library for making this talk possible. Whether it's an in-person program or a virtual program, there are a lot of moving pieces to these events and it takes a lot of work to make them happen. So thank you to Charlene and everyone. And I want to thank all of you for signing up and attending. I'm thrilled that so many people signed up for tonight's talk and I hope we have a lot of folks attending. I see even more folks signing on as I'm speaking. Um, and I want to start tonight with a quick reassurance. Even with Charlene's lovely introduction still ringing in your ears, I think it's important that I reassure you that I'm the right person to give this talk and talk to you tonight about owls. And I say that because many, if not most of you, are meeting me for the first time. And as such, you're noticing things about me. And I'm sure high on that list of things you're noticing about me is the frankly appalling and ever-growing lack of hair on my head. So I may need to reassure you that I do. I really do study owls and not bald eagles. Now this is a bald eagle I photographed in the area where I study owls in Forest Park in St. Louis. Uh, 
And I'm always thrilled to see bald eagles, but I really do focus my time and efforts and energies on owls. Now, with that in mind, we can get into the heart of things tonight. And what I'm going to teach you tonight are methods and techniques and tips and even philosophies that I use to find the owls that I study, the great horned owls that I've been studying now for a little over 15 years. And I know these tips and techniques and policies and procedures work not only for my own work and finding these particular owls, but I also know that they work because I've seen them work in other contexts. These are the same techniques and methods that I use when I help people find owls near their homes, what I call owl consultation. And I'm going to be making myself available to one and all for owl consultation later on at the end of tonight's program. But I have also seen these techniques not just work for myself, but work for people, several other naturalists that I have mentored about owls. I have taught them these methods and philosophies, and I've seen these all of these things work for different people with different owls. So I'm very confident based on healthy empirical evidence that what I will teach you tonight is going to really help you. And we're really lucky because here in the St. Louis area and in much of the world, owls are all over the place. There are over 200 species of owls found across the world and owls are found in every continent except the Antarctic. And just in our St. Louis area, a mix of dense urban and residential and suburban and rural, I've seen owls all over the place from not only just, you know, kind of wilderness areas, but residential areas. I am coming from my home in Dogtown in uh, St. Louis, the city of St. Louis, just south of Forest Park. And people see owls in this neighborhood all the time. And I've seen owls in big yards, small yards, every type of residential area you can imagine. And yes, parks, big parks like Forest Park where I study great horned owls, but even small little pocket parks, you know, a small field, maybe a jungle gym, you can find owls there. And any other good sized green space, including a wide variety of green spaces, such as cemeteries, campuses, golf courses, greenways, any sort of green belt like that, where you have a fair amount of natural space. But again, it can also be residential space too. But all these places are places where you can find owls. And just in the St. Louis area, I've seen owls from uh, Webster Groves to Waterloo, from Clayton to Cruz Corps, you name it. They're all over the place. St. Anne to St. Charles. And you just have to start looking. And once you start to scrape the surface with owls, you realize, wow, they are all over the place and they've been here this entire time. So who might you see? I'm sorry, I couldn't resist making that little pun. Who might you see? Well, in Missouri and Illinois, it's quite interesting. There are eight species of owls and each state has the same eight species of owls. Sometimes I wish each state would have an owl species unique uh, to itself, but it's also kind of cool that they each have the same species. And these eight species are also found in much of the Eastern United States and even parts of the Western United States, as well as um, Canada and into Latin America. So the eight species in our two states are comprised of four statewide year-round residents. And they are the Great Horned Owl, the barred owl, the eastern screech owl, and the barn owl. Now, please notice the different spelling and pronunciation of barred and barn owl. They are very similar sounding, but they are two very different owl species. We have three migratory species in Missouri and Illinois, the long-eared owl, the short-eared owl, and the northern saw-wet owl. That's seven species. So who is left? Well, some of you are probably already there. Indeed, we do get one occasional winter visitor, the snowy owl. Please note that snowy owl has a Y. Some people say, oh, it's a snow owl. No, you want to make sure you add that Y onto that. Now, we're not going to talk about all eight species, but I please don't come away with uh, the impression that you shouldn't bother with all eight species. No, definitely would want to learn about all eight species. 
but we're really going to focus tonight on the three most commonly found species in Missouri and Illinois. And this will also, again, apply to much of the eastern portion of North America. In the western portion of North America, it's going to be one of these species and a close counterpart. So the three species are the great horned owl, barred owl, eastern screech owl. If I was giving this talk in California or Utah, I would definitely change eastern screech owl to western screech owl. And depending where I was in the western United States, I would include or not include barred owl. We're going to look at these three species in greater depth. And I can't help it, I'm a little biased. Uh, since I study great horned owls, we're going to start with great horned owls. And great horned owls are indeed great. They are massive, massive owls, the largest resident owls in both Missouri and Illinois. The snowy owl is larger both in height and weight. So great horned owls are 18 to 25 inches tall. So a foot and a half, just over two feet tall. Very, very large owl. And if you're looking at this owl, two things are probably catching your attention. You're noticing that there are these two objects on top of their head. Well, the name horn gets a little confusing because these are not horns or antlers. They kind of look like ears. And you've heard me mention the long-eared owl, the short-eared owl. Well, they're also not ears. So what the heck are they? They're groups of feathers called tufts. So tufts and yellow eyes are another key thing to look for with great horned owls. But even if you can't see the eye color, if you see a large owl in Missouri and Illinois and much of North America, and it has tufts, it's going to be a great horned owl. It can be completely dark. You might only have a brief glimpse in silhouette. But if you see large and with tufts, boom, great horned owl. You don't have to even see feather colors or anything like that. Now the vocalizations of great horned owls are quite striking and also very helpful because unlike many owls, there's a real noticeable difference between the male hoot and the female hoot. Now speaking of males, this is Charles and I've been studying Charles now for just over 15 years. And this female is the first mate I saw Charles with. And this is Sarah and I saw them together for nine and a half years. Now in the birds of prey, owls, hawks, eagles, vultures, falcons, the females are larger than the males. This is called reverse sexual dimorphism, but it can be hard to tell size apart because they don't always sit next to each other on the branch. But again, thankfully with great horn owls, the male call is quite distinct from the female call. 98% of the time, it's very hard to mistake a male for a female and vice versa. So the male call is low, long, deep notes. Hoo, 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 hoo. The female hoot is shorter, softer, higher notes, and more of them. Hoo, hoo, hoo. So not only is the hoot of male and female different, the hoot of each individual great horned owl is unique. And let's listen to a pair of great horned owls call to each other. This is called a duet when great horned owls, uh, and or any owl for that matter, uh, call to each other. And again, it's just like two people singing, two people playing an instrument. And speaking of instruments, I, I tend to encourage people to think of a great horned owl, the male hoot, like a French horn, and the female hoot more like a clarinet or bassoon. So we're going to hear the male. The female's gonna respond and then they'll go back and forth a little. And it's absolutely a beautiful sound to hear and just absorb. Let's play it again just to kind of latch on to that a little more firmly. So again, first the male, then the female, and then back and forth. <laughs> now, 
never tire of hearing great horned owls. The next species we're going to look at are barred owls. Now, barred owls are good size, 18 to 22 inches tall. So they overlap with great horned owls in size, but they don't get as big as the largest great horned owls. So it's no shrinking violet. And right away, looking at the barred owl, you're noticing something quite different when compared to the great horned owl. Yes, exactly. Round head, no tufts, just a round head. I see it every day in the mirror. And brown eyes. So if you see a large owl in most of the eastern portion of North America and it has a round head, more often than not, it's going to be a barred owl. Now, there are some other large owls without tufts, but you're going to have to go a little further north. But if you're in, say, whether it's Maine or Mississippi, most likely, or Missouri, most likely it's going to be a barred owl. And you don't have to see eye color, just round head, no tufts, and a big owl. So just those two things. People say, hey, Mark, I saw an owl. Was it big? Yes, it was big. Did it have tufts? Yes, great horned owl. Or if they answer no to did it have tufts, then I can say barred owl, just with two things, size, tufts, or no tufts. Now, barred owls are very well known for their call. I'm going to play it first and then give those of you who don't know already the very famous mnemonic phrase that people use to, to translate and remember the call of a barred owl. Now, there is a slight difference between male and female in most owls, including barred owls, where the female is slightly higher pitched. With barred owls, the female will have an extra note or two, but it can be very hard to tell apart. While I have much less experience with barred owls, there have been a couple of times where I have been able to say, yes, that is the male, that is the female. So let's listen to this one barred owl. <coughs> That call is often translated to, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So let's play it again just to hear it now that you have that mnemonic phrase there. <laughs> A barn is also well known for calling during the day, sometimes high noon and they're very vocal and if you hear that sound during the day no it's not a barred owl that forgot to change its clock or something they will call during the day barred owls are also renowned for some really intense duets where the calls get so intense and so frequent that it sounds like a monkey or it's often described as caterwauling and it sometimes sounds not like two owls having a duet, but maybe four or five or six. So let's listen to those very intense duets. <laughs> and this brings me to a, a key point. We're going to uh, notice this with our next owl species as well. All owls have a wide range of vocalizations. It's not just a hoot. And sometimes people get a little kind of puzzled at this. They say, well, what do you mean they just don't hoot? And my response to that is, well, do you just talk? Do you not only talk, but whisper and proclaim and yell and shriek and all the different variations in vocal tone and volume that we have? So yeah. Different owls have barks, they have chitters, they have squawks, they have squeals, they have begging cheeps, but these are the most prominent calls of these species. So those are barred owls, and they are always really neat to see or hear. And our next owl is the eastern screech owl, and this is by far the smallest of the three we're going to look at. Six to eight inches tall, but also has something unique that the other owl that many owl species do not have. There are th three different ways that eastern screech owls can appear because they have three different 
color morphs, or what are also called phases. This is a gray phase eastern screech owl, but they can also be red and brown, and we'll see those in the coming slides. Um, and there is something that they do have in common with great horned owls, and that is, I'm sure many of you are noticing it, yes, tufts and yellow eyes. And one way I often describe eastern screech owls is that they look just like great horned owls that have been left in the clothes dryer too long. So the proportions are exactly the same, but much, much smaller. And again, if you're in Western North America, depending on where you are, uh, most places would have the Western screech owl and some places uh, would have the whiskered, whiskered screech owl. So the call of the Eastern screech owl, the calls, I should say, they have two main calls, which is fascinating. I would not refer to them as a screech. It's a, a name that I often think should be revised. Barn owls, their main call is very screechy. But the Eastern screech owl calls, and make up your own mind, are really not screechy. The, one of them is a long whistling whinny. And this is a red face Eastern screech owl. Beautiful, just asleep in the tree there. And this call is used for declaring and defending their territory. And those calls that we we're hearing from Bard and Great Horned Owl are also used for the same thing. But Eastern Screech Owls, as we'll see, have a yet another main call. But let's listen to that long whistling whinny. It makes me think of a very high-pitched horse. Let's play that one more time just to get it a little further cemented in our head. The second call, and here we have a brown phase, Eastern Screech Owl, you can see how different they look. And once they, this is not a phase in their life, once they get that phase, that will be with them for the rest of their life. Second call is more of a monotone trill. And this is used between mates calling to each other and parents calling to their offspring. And I, I find it quite a pretty call and often makes me think of uh, amphibians like frogs and toads. So here's the trill. And again, we'll play that one more time. And again, it's not screechy at all. Neither of them are screechy. There we have the three most commonly found owls in Missouri and Illinois, and yes, much of the eastern portion of North America. And again, I would encourage you to learn about the other species, but these are the ones you're most likely going to find. Um, and I'm happy to say I've seen all three of these species, and I would, again, the more owls, the merrier. So I do want to just pause here with a word of caution about big white owls. Very interesting thing is that the undersides of great horned owls and barred owls, when they fly, they show many white feathers, especially when they're lit up by light, whether it's artificial light or man-made light. And at least a few times a year, I'll have people say, hey, Mark, I saw this huge white owl went right through my car headlights or went right through the street light, I know it was a snowy owl. And I'll ask them, okay, what month was this? And they'll say, um, July. And I'll say, that would be almost impossible in Missouri and Illinois to see a snowy owl in July. So just a word of caution about that. If you see an owl with a lot of white feathers, doesn't mean that it's a snowy owl. That is a snowy owl. And I think you can see the, the real difference in the amount and quality of those white feathers. Um, but that doesn't mean you couldn't see snowy owls. In fact, snowy owls were popping up very nicely in uh, several places in Illinois this winter and a couple places in Missouri. But I do want to caution you there. Now, in terms of finding the owls in your neighborhood, timing is really really key. There are three best times of day where you're most likely and to find owls and to find them with as 
little work as possible. Still going to have to put in a lot of work, but not as much as, say, some of the other times of day. And those three times of day are about an hour before sunset, the middle of the night, and around sunrise. And this is a photo of Charles from the summer of 2019, right at sunset. Of these three times, I find that for most owls, an hour or so before sunset is the best time. You have some light with which to work. This is when the owls are starting to wake up and they stretch and they groom and begin to call. I can often find the owls that I study at noon because I've spent so long studying them, but it's also often harder to find them and it's generally not the most interesting time to watch them because why? They're asleep. You know, it's sort of like it's sort of like saying, hey, let's go watch the humans at two in the morning on a Wednesday. Most of us will probably be in bed. But if you said, hey, let's go watch the humans at nine o'clock in the morning, most of us are gonna be out and about and getting ready for the day. So timing definitely key. Now there's when it comes to finding owls, it's a multi-sensory project. You're using your eyes, your ears, everything. And as far as your ears and eyes go, you want to use them together. And you want to look up and listen, not only for these calls and these owls that we've seen, but for other things that are telling you, or at least hinting at the strong possibility of owls. You want to look up and listen for birds and mammals making warning calls and or birds and mammals harassing owls. Now these warning calls will also be done to other predators. So it's a great way to find predatory animals. And this behavior is called mobbing. And this is Charles being mobbed by some American crows a few years ago. And if you hear or see mobbing behaviors, it might be an owl, could also be a hawk, depending on the time of day. It could be a snake, could be your neighbor's cat, but it's a great way to find predators. And I'm always listening for warning calls, and it's especially helpful in much of North America during the summer when birds are having babies and very protective of their young and, well, and also teaching their young about the dangers of predators. So all of these owls we looked at are predatory animals, and the bigger the owl, the more of a threat they are. And the downside of that is that these owls don't have a lot of friends. But the plus side for us is that they can really lead us to the owls. So you're listening not only for the owls, but for other animals that can lead you to owls. You want to look up, of course, but you also want to look down for owl evidence. So there are two types of owl evidence. And one of them are their droppings bright white droppings, often dubbed appropriately whitewash, because it looks just like what Tom Sawyer was painting the fence with. And if you see a lot of droppings in an area, that's going to tell you that an owl has been using that spot. I would look up, um, but even if an owl isn't there, I would make a note of that spot and come back at another time and see if an owl is there. The other type of owl evidence that you're looking for are their pellets. Now, some of you are probably like me in April 2021, and you can say, yes, I'm familiar with owl pellets. I have dissected owl pellets. Some of you might be like me back in 2005, and you're saying, what's a pellet? Well, this is a pellet. All the things that owls cannot digest, fur, bones, feathers, all these things, get compacted in the owl's gizzard, special part of their digestive tract, and then ejected out of the mouth. And the pellet will, boom, land on the ground. It sometimes it gets stuck in branches and trees. And again, to like the whitewash, if you see a number of pellets, that is telling you, hey, an owl has spent time here. And not too surprisingly, you, where you find pellets, you're often going to find wash, whitewash intermixed and close by and vice versa, um, kind of one-stop shopping, one-stop shopping. Um, so feathers, all, uh, pardon me, pellets, whitewash, all these things are great in giving you clues to owls. Now, in terms of actually spying the owl in the tree, one of the hardest things to do, the mental search image that you want to form is of a conical vertical shape. 
I'll never forget leading an owl prowl a number of years ago. And Charles was a little tricky to find for this one lady. And when she finally saw him, she made this great comparison. She said, oh man, he looks just like a pine cone. I remember thinking, yes, brilliant, write that down. Because the owl shape, we've already seen it from some of the pictures, it's vertical and conical. And one of the kind of obvious, but also it's one of those things that you might need someone uh, to point it out, is that tree branches mostly go out at an angle or flat, horizontal, just as you see in this tree. Well, the owls do almost everything standing up, nice and tall. And so that vertical conical shape contrasts with the angular or horizontal branch, just as we're gonna see in the next few pictures. So here's Charles on a more angular branch. And yes, he's clearly silhouetted as well, but you can still see how he pops off that branch. Far less silhouetted, not silhouetted at all on a more horizontal branch is Charles again, but still you see how that vertical conical shape is completely different from that horizontal branch. So that's one of the key things to have that search image ready and right at the front of your mind and looking for the vertical conical that's contrasting with the angular or horizontal branch. Now, where do you look in the tree? Short answer is almost everywhere. For many owls, you definitely want to look high, but also you want to look low. You want to look close to the trunk and away from the trunk. This is Charles in a spot in November 2016, and it took me three days to find him there, and I could hear him hooting very clearly. I knew he was in a pretty small vicinity, like, hey, Charles is in this room, but where? And I didn't find him the first two days because I was looking like this and not like this. Not only that, he was so close against that massive trunk that he just disappeared against that trunk. So it is not easy. And you basically have to look everywhere. And a key thing, key phrase that I use is it is all about the angle. It's not just finding the tree, but putting yourself in the right spot, the right angle to find the owl. And that's not going to come immediately because you have to work the angles. You can't just look at a tree from one angle and say, uh, I don't say anything. All right, let's go over there. You often have to look at the same tree from multiple angles because again, it is all about the angle and they will mix it up and vary it tremendously. Just be prepared for that. But if you get the angle, memorize the tree and memorize the angle. How whatever worked for you to put bearings. Okay, it's by this branch of this log or it's near this bush, stand here and boom, there's the angle. And while you're doing that, again, be open to plenty of variations. The key second phrase that I use very frequently and try and impress it upon others is you want to use the following mantra, maxim, aphorism, open eyes, open ears, open mind. Be open to new possibilities, even as you get to know the trees and the angles on them. And I've seen this happen countless, countless times of one owl in the same tree in different spots of the tree. So I have to learn different angles because again, it is all about the angle. And let's look at some examples. So here's Charles uh, much lower down and much further from the trunk in this Eastern red cedar from his third mate, Samantha, who's much closer to the trunk and much higher up. And you're not always going to find a pair of owls together in the same tree. I'll show you examples of uh, both owls in the same tree and owls in different trees. Here is Sarah in a tree that sadly came down a few years ago, the eastern tree. Massive, massive tree. And here is Charles on a different day in the eastern tree in a completely different spot. And between these two photos, do you think I had to work the angles and find different angles? You bet your boots. So 
beautiful either way, either owl, either spot. A few summers ago here in another tree, I had to learn a new angle on this tree, a tree that I've known for years and years. Uh, Charles is very high up in this tree and in the same tree, much lower down, his third mate, Samantha. This is uh, an example from late summer, early fall of 2020. Here's Charles in a newer perch spot of his, and they do vary their trees as well. So here's Charles uh, in this tree, in this spot in this tree on a cloudy day. Here's Charles in the same spot, in the same tree on a sunny day. It almost looks like different owl, different tree. It's the same owl, same tree, same spot in that tree. So the only constant in is change. They will vary their perch spots. The light conditions are going to be different. And you just work with that. And it's fun, it's challenging, and it never gets old. Now, a key thing is to never underestimate the camouflage. There is an owl in that picture. And I'm going to point it out right here. A nice thing to look for with great horned owls is that white patch of feathers on their throat called the guler sac. I'll go back to the last slide, the previous slide, so you can see it even more. It's like they're wearing a, a big white turtleneck. So if you look for the guler sac, that can help it. But even with the guler sac, never underestimate the camouflage because the camouflage is not just color, but it's also texture and behavior. The owls are really good at not only imitating leaves and branch and bark and conifer needles and vines, they're also really good at imitating statues and they will just stand very, very still. So here's an example of some of the challenges with getting the angle and with camouflage. This is Charles, uh, again, the Guler sack was uh, very helpful, in a spot in the fall of 2019. And it took me a while to get the angle. I could hear him cooting very quick, uh, very clearly. And I just had to keep working the angle. But I found this angle. And when he hooted, they leaned forward when they hooted. I could see even more of him. But I wasn't quite satisfied. And I thought, OK, I think I might be able to find a better angle where I've got a little more of a silhouette that's still at a nice, good, safe distance from him. And I worked the angle. And I got this angle. Still obscured, but a little easier to see. Now, I'm going to give you a note of caution and consolation. When you start to look for owls, or you've been looking for owls, and you're spending even more time looking for owls, you're going to see lots of false positives, things that look like owls but are not. And that's okay. This happens to everyone all the time. I was at a different park uh, yesterday, and I had several false positives. Squirrel nests are a big one. They have that uh, nice coloration and the vertical conical shape. Another also frustrating but frequent false positive, again with that shape, are wasp nests. And I've had to memorize certain wasp nests over the years to make sure, yes, that is not an owl, but it is a wasp nest. And other things. It can be just a group of dead leaves. There's a group of dead leaves that I am, I hope they, they're not dead this summer because last summer they got me several times. But also how branches are curved and how they're shaped. This is a branch I found uh, about 14 months ago. And that, especially at night, really looks like a great horn owl. And I've even pointed it out to a few people, and they just shake their heads. Uh, and it can also be man-made things, like a plastic bag caught in a tree. My first year or so of watching uh, Charles and Sarah, there's this large black, you know, garden trash bag, what have you, stuck up in a tree. I can't tell you how many times I went, oh, it's not an owl. Now, the thing to do is if you see something that looks like an owl, don't dismiss it as not an owl. If you have binoculars, take a closer look and verify one way or, or the other. If it's not an owl, no harm, no foul. If it is an owl, hey, awesome, fantastic, well done. But definitely be wary 
and don't be overly upset by these false positives. It's going to happen. Now, I often have people say, hey, Mark, I hear an owl or I'm hearing two owls, but I cannot see them. Now, this is the most technical, very intense bit of advice I'm going to give all night. If you want to grab, take a moment, grab a pen and write this down. It's very complicated. If you hear them that away, go that away. And if they move this way, go this way. If you hear them hooting and you can't see them, just follow their hoots. And yes, they're going to move and hoot in other spots, but you have to try and follow them. And I've had this happen many times now, even 50 years of studying owls. Okay, I'm hearing one. Well, I'm not seeing them yet. Let's just follow the hoots. But if you don't take that first step, and never mind the second step, you're not going to see that. So that away, go that away. This is Charles and Sarah Duetti back in 2012. Now, if you see or hear an owl, it's in your local park, on your block, in your backyard, what have you, there's something that you need to do, and you need to do it three times. Document, document, document. Now, what do you need to document? Some really key information. First of all, when is it happening? The day and the time, and then the where, the location, and what type of owl. Now, how do you document it? Whatever works for you. There's so many great ways to document things. Some people carry a pad of paper in their pocket. And they write things down. Others of us take photos. Some people carry around an audio recorder. Some people shoot video. And most of us are carrying in our pockets a notebook, a computer, a camera, a video camera, and a tape recorder, an audio recorder, don't be shy about using your phone. One thing, if you can't see the owl, but you're hearing the owl, still record video. That way you can get the audio of the recording. But if you don't document it, you're really not going to help yourself find that owl or owls again. So you really want to get date, time, and location, and what type of owl, and document it in the best way that works for you at that moment in that situation. I take a lot of photos and videos and I put them in a uh, folder unique to that day. And this is just an example of one of my folders and it's the folders uh, dated and titled and nice and organized like that. And that's how I do it. What works for me may not work for you. It's, you know, some people can draw. I cannot draw to save my life. Um, but if you're good at drawing, draw away. Now, you might be saying, well, what if I don't know what type of owl it is? That's totally fair. You still want to get some key information down. Again, the day, the time, and the location. And you want to note your impressions of the owls. No matter how much or how little you're seeing or hearing, note your impressions of size. Was it big? Was it small? Did it have tufts or no tufts? Did you see the color of feathers? Did you see the color of eyes? If you didn't, make a note of that too. Didn't see eye color. Did see brown feathers, white feathers. And note your impressions of the vocalizations and try and put it in a very objective way. As I mentioned earlier with the call of a male great horn owl being like a French horn. And a call of a female being more like a clarinet or bassoon. Most People above the age of, say, eight will know what that sounds like. Um, but if you just put it in a more um, personal way, something not as objective, much more subjective, that's going to be really tricky. I'll have people come to me and they'll say, hey, Mark, I heard this owl and I went, hoo, and someone else perhaps seeing the same species of owl, hey, Mark, I saw this owl, and I went, oh, well, one person's hey, it might be another person's hall. But if you say French horn or who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, or kind of sound like a winning horse, again, a more objective comparison. So even if you can't tell the type of owl, document, document, document. And then whether you know the type of owl, whether you don't know the type of owl, you need to hit the books. The key part of 
this work is field work. A huge part is hitting the books, doing the homework. This is the first book on owls that I owned, and I was very lucky to start with this excellent book, Owls by Connie Toops. And I uh, passed it on to the people that I've mentored. Excellent first book with which to start. But I didn't stop with one book. I now have over 50 books on owls. Because anytime you study anything in nature, whether it grows on the ground, flies in the air, swims in the water, what have you, you have to do the homework and the field work because each type of work helps and inspires the other type. You gotta sit down in your favorite chair and learn the facts. What I'm sharing with you tonight is not just from 15 years of field work, nor is it from 20 minutes on Wikipedia, it's from 15 years of intensive research. But even now I see owl behavior that makes me scratch my head, what was that? And I keep doing my homework and then I'll be doing my homework learning a new fact or getting an additional nuance of a behavior I thought I knew pretty well already, and my feet will get itchy. And I, man, I have to go out and apply what I've learned from my homework into my field work. Now, I would say this anyway, but I really want to make this point strongly because of our lovely host tonight. You really want to use your local libraries and beyond. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about at that. So I mentioned I have all these books on owls. Well, where did I find them? I don't want to give you the impression that I just went to Amazon and went click, click, click. No, I went to libraries. Every library to which I had access to, when I started studying owls, I went click, 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 click. And this might be obvious, but I definitely want to point it out. The vast majority of books that I now own I check them out numerous times before buying them, before, you know, okay, what are the books I need to have at arm's reach? And what are the books I don't need to? Caveat emptor, a great Latin phrase, let the buyer beware. And again, very easy to do. And it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it again. Whether it's owls or anything else, libraries are an amazing place to find expert works on owls and all subjects for little or no cost. Now people say, oh, everything's online. Well, one, no, not everything is online. And I find that if you want the best and most reliable information, use your libraries. There's a ton of great online resources for owls. I use them frequently. I'm gonna share some with you, but you really want the best depth and breadth on owls or anything else, use your libraries. And you really wanna use all the libraries available to you. And here in the St. Louis area, we have amazing reciprocal agreements between different library systems. I do not live in Maplewood. I live next door in Dogtown in the city of St. Louis, but I have a card for the Maplewood Public Library and the other libraries in the Municipal Library Consortium. I also have a library card for the city of St. Louis, public library system, what's called the St. Louis Public Library System. I have a library card for the St. Louis County Library System. And I even have a virtual card for the St. Charles City County Library System. I don't go to their libraries that much because I rarely go to St. Charles, but anyone living in St. Louis County, St. Louis City and St. Louis, or pardon me, uh, St. Louis County, St. Louis City, St. Charles can have access to those four different library systems. And if you're not watching from the St. Louis area, this is going to be true in many different parts of the US and beyond. So talk to your local library about, hey, what other libraries do I have access to? And I also wanna encourage people to not be shy about using academic libraries. Uh, as you learned in the intro, I work at Fompon University in Clayton. It's a suburb of St. Louis. And like many, Academic libraries, the library there welcomes members of the general public to use their materials. Um, that is, many academic libraries right now in the pandemic are just keeping the libraries to their faculty, students, and staff, but hopefully as things improve, that will return. And I use academic libraries all the time for my research on owls, and I encourage you to do the same. Now, libraries can be a little intimidating, well, that's why Charlene and her colleagues are there. Ask the staff for help. And if you're 
rusty with libraries, that's okay. You can always get better. I'm better at using libraries today than I was two years ago, six years ago, 12 years ago. You can always get better. And yes, you think of libraries as books, but also use all the resources in libraries, including very importantly, the databases for magazine, newspaper, and journal articles. These databases are often very expensive and libraries have to make tough decisions about what databases they keep, what do they use their money for. So use those databases. And I wanna share with you my OWL bibliography. And these are books and websites that I have used, read, reread countless times. Um, and I recommend anything and everything here. I do have this listed uh, on my website as well. Um, and I'll be sharing my website uh, at the end of our talk. It was also mentioned in the intro. So homework is really key. But there's also a third piece, collaboration. Talking to other folks. Talk to your neighbors and fellow park goers. What you see in your neighborhood, what you see in your local park is significant, but it's only a slice of the pie. Share with them what you see and ask them to share what they know. Asking those key questions. Hey, what do you see? Where do you see it? When do you see it? What time of day, what time of year? This is something I began to do uh, when I started to go to Forest Park and study the wildlife there in the early 2000s. And I continued doing that. And through that, learning and sharing, you kind of build up uh, an informal database of, hey, what's a good spot to look for various animals? And I would not be here speaking with you today unless I had had one conversation with one person about the owls that I had found in late... August, early September 2005, but I wasn't having much luck finding them. And one conversation with my then colleague, Papasha Biswas. Papasha, I am grateful to you to my dying day. Literally was game changing, life changing. And it turns out I was looking for the owls in part of their hunting territory, but I was about a half mile away from the core of their territory. And without that conversation, I would not be here today. So it's a really positive thing. You're going to learn more and people are going to be very grateful for what you can share with them. It's also just a good way to be a neighbor and even make new friends. From studying the owls, I've met people and become friends with people that I probably would not have met otherwise. <coughs> Pardon me. And a wide range of folks, different ages and professions and geographic areas, and they've become dear friends. So it's a really key thing. You don't want to do this in a vacuum. You want to reach out to people. So you put all of these things together, field work, documentation, research, and collaboration. If you're doing all of these in a good way, in a nice balanced approach, you are going to see and hear owls more frequently and consistently. But I must share a very key warning. And that is, observing owls is totally addicting. I have seen it happen in my life and I've happily seen it happen in many other people's lives. We see an owl and you want to see more and the more you see, the more you want to see, the more you want to see. Um, so just be prepared for that. Now I want to give you a recent example, not super recent, but still recent enough of all the things we've talked about in terms of finding the owls and this was uh, back in November, and uh, Charles had been starting to use a spot he's used in the last few winters, a group of uh, three short and not very thick uh, eastern red cedars. And I knew about this spot because I had documented that, yes, in the last few winters, Charles has been going to the skinny cedars, as I call them. Uh, naming trees and groups of trees that the owls can use can be very helpful as well. And on this day, I thought, okay, Charles has been in the skinny cedars a lot recently, and there's an easier angle to find him, but I wanted to give myself a little challenge, and I went to a, a much harder angle. And this was my first glimpse of Charles. I'm seeing a bit of the white on his chest and the guler sack. 
but I worked the angle and I found a little more of Charles. Tail feathers hanging down from the branch can be very helpful as well. Now, still not a great view of him, but I worked the angle and saw even more of it, more of his chest, get a hint of the face, the tail feathers hanging down. And at this point I said, okay, it's definitely Charles. He's in the skinny cedars. Let's go to that easier angle, which was on a full 180 degrees, if not a little more on the other side of that tree. And that led me to this angle, able to see much more of them, the setting sun hitting it beautifully. But again, from working the angles and learning the angles and memorizing the angles, I knew, ah, if I come over here, I'm going to see even more of him. And as he began to wake up and stretch and groom, Charles made it even easier to see him. I didn't have to move at all because he did. He hopped out further onto the branch, and now I could see him in all his amazing beauty and power that is Mr. Charles. So I did my homework, I did my documentation, and yes, I've shared the skinny cedars with other people, uh, and they've been able to learn and find him there as well. And these were, uh, this is also an example of how their purse spots can vary. He's only been using the skinny cedars uh, in winter in the last few years. And some of the other conifers that he's used more regularly in prior years, he's not been using more regularly. So they're going to keep you on your toes. So that's a fun thing too. Now there are some other key things to note in terms of observing owls in an ethical and legal way. Uh, not only observing them, but how you document them and how you do your collaboration. And the ethical thing is very important. The most important thing about you and an owl is the animal's welfare is the most important consideration. It's more important than you seeing the owl. It's more important than you getting a better angle on the owl. It's more important than you getting a photo or a better photo. The animal's well-being is the most important thing. You always have to keep that highest in your mind. Am I disturbing this animal? I, am I in danger of disturbing this animal? If the answers to those questions are yes, alter what you're doing. The question I get very frequently, it's a very good question, is how close is too close? If you think you're too close, if you're listening to your subconscious and you think you're too close, you probably are too close. If you're noticing changes in the owl's behavior, its, it's facial expression, its movement, stop where you are and back off. An amazing thing about where I study great horned owls, this park, forest park, is a huge park, and it's visited by 13 million people a year. And the population of Missouri is 6 million people a year. And people come to forest park and do everything under the sun. But we all conclude our time in the park in the same way. We go home and the owls and everything else that lives in the park, it is their home. Now you might have an owl in your backyard and it's your property, it's your name on the deed, that's still the owl's home and you want to be a good guest. So the ethical aspect is very important. Should you share the owl's location? If so, how? I have found the best, most ethical way to share an owl's location is not to give someone GPS coordinates or the intersection of Maple and 4th Street, but it's to say, if you want to see them, I would like to take you out to show, to show the owls to you. I'll show you where to look and where to be and how to look so you're not too close and things like that. That will separate the people that are, eh, well, that's okay, the more casual people for the people that are genuinely interested. But I really think it's not a good idea to say X marks the spot. I have given people X marks the spot directions when I have established that they have a lot of experience observing and documenting wildlife in a safe and ethical manner. But if someone just called me and said, hey, where are the owls? I would say, come on out on an owl prowl and I will show you. 
legal? Should you be in this place at the time of day? Um, parks, some parks are sunrise to sundown. Forest Park has a curfew between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. You want to make sure that you are obeying the law. If it is private property, you want to have very clear permission to do to be there at that place at that time. Uh, if you don't have that permission, obtain it. If you if that permission is denied, respect that denial. Uh, I've thankfully I've never had any situation of well, Mark the Outman said I could come here and do this, um, but really you do want to be very clear on the legal side of things. Now, people ask me about equipment, and that's a really important thing. They'll say, oh, do I have to go out and get this and get that? My answer is use what you have. Start slowly. I started with a $40 pair of binoculars that my girlfriend took out of her basement. And as I got more serious and more involved, I have slowly upgraded from there. Same with my cameras, same with my outdoor gear. So use what you have, start slowly. It's not, oh yes, you, know, you have to spend $5,000 or $200. Just use what you have and go from there. Some definite key things to note about clothing. You want to wear dark muted colors. You don't want to wear anything that looks like fur or is fur. And you want to be comfortable for the weather conditions. If you're out on a hot, blistering summer night and you're not ready for those conditions or you're out on a freezing cold winter day you're gonna be miserable if you're not prepared but if you're comfortable and prepared for it you're gonna spend be able to spend more time and spend more time focused on observing and documenting the owls and less time going oh man it's so cold or oh geez i'm boiling up in here now you're seeing me here wearing the proper attire to present uh, the winter is trying to make a comeback here in St. Louis these past two nights, so I broke out the tweed jacket. Um, but you would never see me wearing a bright blue shirt like this. Uh, you're going to see me dress like this. Dark muted colors, boots, backpack, cameras, binoculars. Yes, the car with the license plate, Outman, that's my car. And you've probably noticed some different facial hair and lack of facial hair. What you're seeing in this photo and in the uh, virtual flesh tonight, this is winter plumage, full beard. Uh, in about a month, it's going to get uh, shaven down to a goatee, spring plumage. And then about a month after that, I'll shave it all off for a few months, summer plumage. But all this stuff that I have on, I'm ready to escalate up or down as the weather conditions change. I have an umbrella in there. Um, I'm ready and I'm going to be comfortable. Um, last night was the first night in a few weeks that I had to break up gloves and a, a hat covering my ears, but I had that ready. So you'll, if you want to be comfortable, you want to be a non-presence in the owls area. I often say, if you want to study a well-camouflaged, silently flying animal, do your best imitation of them. As I mentioned earlier, I help people find owls near their homes. I call this owl consultation. I am more than happy to help you find owls near your home. Don't be scared by this word, consultation. I do it for free. All right, an adult beverage. Okay, two adult beverages. No, seriously, I really enjoy doing this for two key reasons. It helps me share what I know and help other people but also broadens and deepens my owl experiences and knowledge. And it's just one of those great win-win-win things. Now, please don't think that if you have me over for owl consultation, that in five minutes I'll be able to point out, oh yes, there is a great horned owl. Uh, her name is Denise. Uh, she's five years old. Uh, she's a Libra, very sensitive. She prefers meadow voles to prairie voles. Uh, except on odd dated federal holidays in the spring financial quarter. No, I may not, we may not see anything, but I'm going to, a minimum, give you really helpful hints of where to concentrate your efforts, what to do, how to do it. Um, I also want to invite everyone to join me on an Owl Prowl, a two hour tour 
to see the owls that I study in Forest Park. I lead owl prowls all year long, weekends, weekdays, in a never-ending cycle. Uh, even in the pandemic, I've managed to still lead 65 owl prowls last year. I've already led 25 or 26 this year. To schedule an owl prowl, please uh, email me three to four dates. I really want to stress that. Um, that will give us more uh, time, days and times from which to choose from. Once we set the date, um, I'll set up the time again about an hour before sunset. During the pandemic, uh, I am taking out smaller groups, so one to four people. If you, pardon me, have a larger group, I am more than happy to schedule multiple people, multiple prowls to accommodate all those people. And yes, there is my email address. If you want to have this all wrapped up, I really want to wish you all the best of luck in finding owls in your neighborhood. It is a real fun, interesting pursuit. It never gets old. And if you want to learn more about the owls uh, that I study in my work with them, please ask Charlene and her colleagues to have me back. I have three other talks. Uh, my general talk on the owls that I study, hiding in plain sight, uh, and then two more specific talks, one on hunting and feeding behaviors, and then one on mating, nesting, and those crazy cute owl babies, owlets. Um, you can find me online and learn even more about the owls and my work with them. Uh, I have a pretty dense YouTube page with tons of owl footage and some other critters there as well. Uh, I'm the co-administrator of a Facebook community called Great Horn Owls. And I am on Twitter at Forest Park Owls. And I really want to thank each and every each and every one of you for signing up tonight, for attending tonight. I want to thank Charlene and all of her colleagues for making this possible. And I'm more than happy to take your questions now. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, we'll devote about half an hour to questions now. And I have several already. Um, several which you addressed, but um, I'll try to summarize some and then record the ones we don't get to and pass them on to Mark and share those in the follow-up, as I said. But um, so you talked about ethically um, observing owls, but do you, uh, is there, do you know of any resource online to locate uh, owl sightings in areas and do you, would you recommend those? Um, many states have uh, a birding listserv. Um, in uh, Missouri, it's called MoBirds. Um, the Illinois one uh, is called IBET, I-B-E-T. I forget what the E-T stands for. The I and the B are Illinois birds. Um, people will share sightings uh, there. Those are often some very hardcore and dedicated birders. Um, if you're familiar with the online uh, natural history database, iNaturalist and eBird, those are uh, citizen science projects where people record what uh, bird species, in the case of eBird and in the case of iNaturalist, everything from birds, bugs, to trees and reptiles that they observe. And those could be good places to look that, oh, hey, is this park, have people reported owls there? Now, if they are not reported there, it doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that no one has reported them. But if they are reported there, that can lead you to that general area. Um, but as I mentioned in my first slides, they are really all over the place. And you know, I encourage using any and all resources, but just taking a walk to your local park or around your block at say an hour before sunset is definitely going to be helpful as well. Thank you. Lovely question. Mm -hmm. So along those lines, you talked about how widespread certain species are. We have one viewer from India and they have great horned owls there. Is it the same species or are there differences? Ooh, thank you. Um, there are owls in the same genus as great horned owls in India and everywhere else owls are found except Australia and uh, New Zealand. And the owls uh, of this genus, the genus is called Bubo, B-U-B-O. 
and there are bubo owls uh, in India, uh, the Indian rock eagle owl, uh, and in some northern stretches of India, the Eurasian eagle owl. And while they are cousins of gray horned owls, they are definitely distinct species. And uh, bubo owls are some of the largest owls on the planet. In fact, the two largest owls uh, in the world are in that genus bubo. And I'm uh, thrilled to get this question from India because a good friend of mine, uh, Deepa Mohan in Bangalore, she got to see Charles and the other owls that I've studied for a number of years while she lived here in St. Louis, Missouri. So yes, owls in the same genus, but different species. Hmm. Another question, can you see the tufts of a great horned owl when it's in flight? And then I'm adding to this, if not, or if so, what other um, characteristics can you look for when an owl is in flight to identify it? Lovely question about the tufts. Uh, an amazing thing about tufts, while they are just groups of feathers, they the owls have control over them, like a dog and cat's ears. They do reflect mood and emotional state. And owls that have tufts, when they fly, they tuck those tufts back. So you actually don't see the tufts. I was leaving an owl prowl two nights ago, and we saw Charles fly off, and one of the folks on the prowl keenly observed, oh, wow, the tufts are tucked back. One of the biggest things about owl flight, and this is not all owls, but the vast majority of owls, is that they fly silently. So one of the biggest things to listen for is no sound. And whether it's 200 yards away, but really importantly, very close, the silent flight is so intensely silent that it's almost loud. And you just notice this absence of sound. And especially with the bigger owls, this is really striking. I have had Charles uh, fly one to three feet past me and over me with a wingspan of four to five feet wide, and you hear nothing. And sometimes people say, well, owls fly quietly. And I remind them that there is a big difference between quietly and no sound. So, um, Another thing in flight that will, say, distinguish an owl from a hawk, um, there's some hawks, very comparable size to different owl species, is that the owls have a much more barrel-shaped body, and they really don't have head and then shoulders, just it's all body, and then at the top of the body is the head. Uh, kind of like some offensive linemen in uh, large you know, football teams. Um, just no, no neck, just goes up from the body. Um, so that's a, another thing to look for, the barrel shape. And it can be quite striking. For example, red-tailed hawks, very common. And you see them in flight. Wow, that's a big bird. And then you see a great horn owl, also very common. Quite different, that shape. Thank you. So a um, couple questions about coloration. Do eastern screech owls phase, phases pass on from parent to offspring? So, for example, do red phase parents have red phase offspring? And then another question about coloration for barred owls and great horned owls. Do those owls have variations in coloring over their lifetimes? Excellent question about uh, screech owl phases. Um, you can have screech owls apparent uh, in gray phase and apparent in brown phase, and they'll have owlets in different phases. I haven't read deeply enough, but you're making me want to go back and uh, actually even tell you the book in my owl bibliography that I would use to look further into that. But my, from the modest reading I have done on Easter screech owls is that it's not, okay, red, mom will equal red youngsters and, or gray phase, dad will equal gray phase. You can have, again, parents of different phases having owls of different phases. I can't give you exact percentages and how that exactly manifests itself, um, but in general, yes, that is possible. Um, with barred owls and great horned owls, all owls have two to three different plumages for the time they hatch until the time they become adults. 
So there is a variation over time, but it's relatively quick. Um, you really can't look at, say, a great horned owl above the age of one and just say, oh, that's that's a young one or that's a, a seven-year-old just by their feathers. They, you know, they don't get gray hair um, or gray feathers. Um, and there are variations in the feathering uh, colors of different great horned owl subspecies. Um, for example, uh, great horned owls in the uh, Southwest, uh, that subspecies, much lighter colored, uh, smaller subspecies, say in marked contrast to the uh, species in the Pacific Northwest, very large, one of the largest subspecies and much darker. Um, Barred owls, I have not read about any uh, geographic variations, uh, but I would be open to that. So that the different color phases of uh, screech owls, that's definitely something quite uh, striking about them that you're not gonna find in many owl species. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this was a question that I'm gonna feed off of. Who, who named the owls or who gets to give the owls their names? And then I wanted to also ask you, what makes George, George for Charles. You? Charles, sorry. <laughs> English kings, it's okay. Yeah, exactly, right? And he's he's so regal. Um, in any case, so what makes him definitely, oh, that's definitely Charles, and then how did you name your owls, and who or who named your owls? Um, I named the owls. I named the, the trees and groups of trees that they use. Uh, occasionally, I get a little pushback. Well, why do you get to do that? I think I've earned that. Uh, I've been studying Charles for 15 years. I'm out there over 300 nights a year. Um, and uh, I'm grateful that people have adopted the names of the owls and uh, the names of the trees. The names of the trees can be very important, um, you know, especially as people spend more time watching them. Uh, for example, today, um, what my newest owl mentee, my friend Alexis Miano, uh, messaged me and said, Charles is in the Crossroads conifers. And I knew exactly what group of conifers she was talking about. Because uh, there's approximately 45,000 trees in Forest Park. And Alexis had said, oh, Charles is in that tree and it has branches and bark. That would not be very helpful. Um, the name, why the name Charles? That was a gut reaction, just boom, I saw this owl, Charles. As I thought about it after the fact, I thought Charles is a good name. It has a wide variety of associations. I mentioned one, English Kings, but it also could be the guy down the block. Hey, Charles, how you doing? Um, and then as I thought about it even more, my girlfriend, Wendy, is a, a connoisseur of cute, especially cute animals. And I thought, oh, Wendy's gonna love that name for this owl. And sure enough, when Wendy comes out to see Charles, she she just beams at him and coos. Oh, Charles, Charles. Um, how do I know it's Charles? That's a fair question, um, but I would also answer it by saying, think of someone you've known for over a decade and you hang out with them over 300 times a year. You're probably going to know that that is... Steve and not that Steve or not that Mark or not that Charlene. Um, the other day I was looking for the Maplewood Public Library's website and I accidentally went to the Maplewood Public Library in Maplewood, New Jersey, my mom's home state. My mom was watching. Hi, mom. Um, and yeah, two towns named Maplewood, and but different. Um, there are some definitely objective qualities of Charles. Um, his markings are unique to him. Um, the more I've studied him, the more I've learned his posture, his attitude, what German scientists call the vibe. His call is unique. Um, again, the call of male great horn owl is different from female, but different males sound different from different males and vice versa. Um, so yeah, there are some objective differences, but also very plainly that I've spent a lot of time with them. Are there, have I had nights? 
uh, where I've mistaken Charles for his mate. Yeah, that has happened, depending on the angle. There's that word again, the angle, the likes, you know, what I had for lunch that day. Are, have those times been few and far between? Sure. Do they happen? Are they going to happen? Yes. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I know it's Charles. I'm, I'm just so lucky and honored to have studied him so long. So you're, Thank talking, you. Great uh, questions. you're welcome. Um, you talked about hooting. So <laughs> does one gender typically initiate hooting? It can vary from different species. I, I've never read about a, an overall, yes, the male starts or the female starts. Um, with Charles, and I've seen him now with five mates. Um, Charles has most of the time started the hooting, but I've seen plenty of variations to that. Um, I, I would want to research that a little further with say some of the, you know, all three of these species, but just from what I've read, I have not read, I've never read anything about um, Eastern Screech Owls and Barred Owls. Um, and just thinking I'm reading a new book on snowy owls, I, I've never read anything that says, oh yes, most of the time it's the male, um, even within a species. Um, and, uh, but yeah, a great topic to dig further in. and. As I said before, and this is a perfect example, the research never stops. Mm -hmm. And one of the important things when you become more versed in a topic is to be very frank and say, look, I'm not sure. I don't know. Let's look into that. So you, you covered in your talk um, how at one point you were in a hunting area. Um, so how do you, how would you recommend for other people to kind of find where the owls are nesting, where they where they spend their their sleep time versus hunting areas and so forth? Well, everything I I talked about today was how to find them in their most frequent spots where they perch and roost and perhaps nest. Um, I wasn't advocating yes, go look for hunting areas where I found the owls back in 2005. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I there was a good chance I was in the core of their territory, but as I learned, no, the core, core of their territory is about a half mile that way. And that took me that conversation uh, to, to learn that. Um, and not only the conversation, but then my subsequent observation of the owls going into that area where I found them and watching them hunt. And just to flesh and feather this out a little more, when I first saw the owls in this area, which turned out not to be the core of their territory, I was seeing them one out of 10 times. And it was very challenging because it was enough to keep me going, but enough to be really frustrating. And anytime I brought out Wendy or another friend, no owls. So that's why that conversation was so important. And I went from, with that conversation, I went from one out of 10 to three out of 10, and then a very key date, um, unlike the first date that I saw them, I didn't write that date down, but December 29th, 2005, what I call my anniversary, that's when I began to see Charles and Sarah more regularly. I went from one out of 10 to three out of 10 to eight, nine, 10 times out of 10 through research, field work, and collaboration. Um, so all of those things were very key. So yes, again, I'm not saying, oh, go look for their hunting areas. That's gonna be much harder to do. Now I would, once you find an owl's area, I would definitely advocate uh, learning their hunting spots. Um, one of the things which I'm proud of is that I've learned not only perch and roost trees and nest trees, but many of their hunting spots. And I can often follow the owls to multiple trees and watch them hunt for a long time. And that's been one of the most challenging and one of the most rewarding things to do. Okay. So with barred owls, since they're vocal during the day, does that also mean they hunt during the day? Just as a clarification, thank you. These are fantastic questions. They're not always vocal during the day. You're not going to hear a barred owl every day at high noon or two o'clock or 10 30.
but you are going to hear that more at those times than many other owl species. And they can hunt during the day. Some of the owls that are very widespread are noted, such as barred owls and great horned owls and eastern screech owls, are known for being highly opportunistic predators. Um, and if prey comes along and the owl is awake and sees it, if it's 1.30 in the afternoon, they're not going to say, well, that's against union law 247. No, if they think they can get it, whether it's 1.30 in the morning or 1.30 in the afternoon, they can and will go for it. Um, and uh, great horned owls, among others, are known for sometimes hunting during the day. Not as much, not as actively as they would at night, but still, it is possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To piggyback off that, what um, I know we talked about how owls have a variety of prey, but what do bars, barred owls typically eat, and what is um, the typical fare for a great horned owl? Mm. Um, both of them have some prey in common, uh, rodents, small birds, rabbits, uh, things that you would often expect from owls. Um, barred owls and great horned owls are very generalist animals in terms of where they live and what they eat. Barred owls do have a tendency to prefer. They can live in many areas, but if they have bottomland forest near water, that is really classic barred owl habitat. And be near water means they eat more aquatic prey, including crayfish, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, um, in addition to birds and mammals. And there is a definite difference in barred owl diet depending on where barred owls live. If they don't live as much near water, they're going to be eating more mammals and birds. One of the things that really hooked me further on bright horned owls is their range of prey. Uh, I knew very little about owls when I started this, but I thought, okay, these are big owls. They're probably going to eat rabbits and rodents and birds. And I started doing my homework, and I learned that, wow, great horned owls eat a wide variety of animals, including fish, amphibians, reptiles, insects, and other invertebrates. That wasn't too surprising. You know, if you can catch a rabbit, you could probably catch a beetle. Not too shocking, which was what was much, much, much more shocking to learn with great horned owls is that great horned owls eat some not-so-small, many not-so-small animals. Great horned owls eat raccoons, skunks, minks, muskrats, groundhogs, pet owners. The larger owls eat small dogs and domestic cats. Great horned owls eat ducks, geese, herons, egrets, wild turkeys, hawks. Great horned owls eat other owls, including barred owls and eastern screech owls, um, among other owl species. Um, and I was just blown away to learn that great horned owls are right at the top of the food chain. I had never imagined any owl as being an apex predator, but sure enough, great horned owls are apex predators. And it's simply mind boggling to watch them go after, say, a great blue heron that is twice their size and a powerful predator in its own right, and to see how terrified that great blue heron is of the great horned owl. Now, great horned owls have the widest range of prey of any owl in North America, but the western and eastern screech owls eat the largest number of species of any owls in North America. The reason between that difference is eastern screech owls, while they do eat a wide range of prey, they, eat a, they also eat a lot of insects, and of course, insect species and numbers of insects even within a species are so numerous that the number of species eaten by eastern and western screech owls easily exceeds great horned owls, but the difference in range of prey is significant. Thank you. So that was a question from a five-year-old. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> they may have gotten a little bit more than they bargained for, <laughs> but hey, it's nature. Uh, Thank you. Lovely. So, uh, a common question um, that I got from several people in, in different forms, how do you attract owls to your property and what about owl houses? 
Excellent question. Um, with owl houses, I I would never discourage someone from using it, but I also encourage you to have very realistic expectations. It's not the movie A Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And this is the same for any type of artificial animal house or nest structure. If you set up a nest or home structure for species A, you might get species Q, and you might also get species zero. You may not get anyone. So you want to have realistic expectations. Um, in terms of should I set up a box? It would be, well, let's look at your area and what's around there. I had a lady in the St. Louis area a few months ago saying, hey, I've been trying to track Eastern Screech Owls for years, and we've set up a box, and we've done a lot of research and a lot of work, and we just they're not showing up. Um, and she said, well, at the same time, I have barred and great horned owls all over the place. And barred and great horned owls eat Eastern Screech Owls. So the eastern screech owls would not, if they're great horned owls and barred owls in an area, the eastern screech owls would not be trying to nest right in that same immediate area. Um, the other thing, in terms of adjusting your property and habitat, it really depends on your property and the surrounding area. For some folks, it might be you can barely see past your nose because of all these trees. You might need to thin thin out some of these trees to create more open areas for hunting. Other places that are bereft and barren of trees, you might need to plant some more trees. So it really varies on the individual place. And that's, again, something I'm happy to consult with. And, uh, you know, what this lady was with the Easter Screech Owl, she finally listened and said, okay, I see your point. I'm trying to, you know, ring the dinner bell to the barred owls and the great horned owls. I said, yeah, you kind of, you kind of are. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely a, a, a worthwhile project. One of the best things that you can do to attract wildlife at all levels of the food chain is to plant native plants, grow things that are, that have evolved to your local soil and rain conditions you're going to attract more insects, more things that eat insects, more birds, everything and everything. So native plantings are, is one of the most crucial things. And to, if you don't have native plantings, remove uh, invasive species. Thank you. Lovely question. Mm -hmm. We'll do a few more um, and then wrap it up. And I will uh, collect the, the rest of the questions and pass them on to Mark and share all the answers. But um, which seasons and which types of trees do you find um, make for your most successful owl prowl, prowls and owl watching? Um, short answer is uh, all of them. <laughs> um, Fall and winter are one of the best times to go looking for the owls in much of North America. This is when the owls are most vocal, when you can get that, ah, let's go that way, because you can hear the owls calling. Uh, in the summer, especially if they've uh, reproduced successfully, a lot of the adult owls, pardon me, are less vocal. So on the vocal side, fall and winter is very helpful. Um, in the winter, for many of these uh, owl species, they will tend to gravitate to conifers, so pines, firs, and cedars. Now, that can be easier in some ways of, well, so, you know, we don't need to concentrate on all these oaks and maples and hickories, but they could be, as you saw with that example for November, they could be challenging to find in the conifers as well. I would not ignore um, deciduous trees in the in the winter either. Um, their uh, Charles's third mate Samantha had a preferred, uh, not her only, but it's definitely a, a spot that she used quite a bit uh, in the winter. And as a deciduous tree with no leaves, but a very large tree, and she would just perch right where a large trunk. Well, pardon me, a large branch was coming off the trunk and she would not be silhouetted 
and she would just look like part of the bark. Um, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, what's the absolute best time? And for the St. Louis area, I would say kind of October in terms of it's not too cold and the owls are vocal. Uh, in the spring, I'd say there's usually a few weeks in April where the trees have it leafed out completely. It's not freezing. Um, but if you dress for the weather, you can go out and see them all year long. And there's no such thing as uh, bad weather, just the wrong clothes. And it, for the, all of these three species we talked about, are permanent residents. They they don't migrate, so you can find them all year long. Uh, summer is definitely the most challenging, but it's a it's a very cool challenge to take up. Thank you. And um, for our last question, a uh, couple things about uh, the field work. So, any words of advice or warning about taking owl pellets for dissection, and then general safety tips for um, field work and observing owls, uh, any of those you could offer? In, great questions. Thank you. Um, with owl pellets, you would want to uh, not touch them with your hands. You would want to get a, uh, a bag, a plastic bag, and scoop them up, kind of like, you know, if you're cleaning up after your dog. Um, you would want to either soak them in a bleach solution or um, put them in an oven, uh, I can't think of, right off the top of my head, the, the proper temperature, the proper amount of time. Again, do your, do your homework and you can find good sources on that. Um, because owl pellets, uh, can, uh, people have been, uh, known to contract salmonella from working with owl pellets that have not been properly treated. Uh, I mean, do keep in mind this is dead animal material that has gone through another animal's digestive tract. So just uh, safety there is key. Um, in terms of safety with the owls, it's, it all goes back to being that good guest, being in their home, dressing in dark muted colors, moving quietly, talking quietly, sharing their location in a smart and discreet way, and not getting too close. And one of the tricky things sometimes with owls is that Sometimes people can get very close to owls and the owls don't fly off and people think, oh, it's not bothered that I'm here. Well, that isn't always the case. The owls are quite good sometimes at standing their ground. And again, all of these animals are predators. The bigger the owl, the more powerful they are. Um, and you don't want to anger and you don't want to get attacked by even an Eastern screech owl that's six to eight inches tall, never mind a great horned owl that eats raccoons. I don't think anyone here watching would mess with a raccoon. You really don't want to anger an animal that does mess with raccoons. Um, and just being that good guest, and if you're not sure, err on the side of caution. My first year, couple of years of studying the owls, I would go around their territory and the edge of it, often with a tree between them and me, and very carefully, incredibly gradually, and very slowly, I slowly moved closer in to the owls. And even now, I still move carefully. I get closer faster, but I'm moving slowly. I'm, I even wrap my keys in a rag so my keys don't jangle. I'm trying to be the best guest that I can be. Um, you know, if there's an element of trust and recognition with Charles, I don't take it as a given. I try and earn it and build on it every day and always be mindful that, hey, this is a powerful, wild animal. Behave accordingly. Thank you, everyone. Great questions. This is a real thrill. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and your insightful answers. Um, and we will be following up via email. And uh, you, uh, all the panelists or and all the attendees, I believe, have either the library's email address or my direct email address with any additional questions or comments. And thank you so much for joining us.
Uh, any final words, Mark? Just thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Maplewood Public Library. Thank you, everyone, for signing up and for attending. And I wish you all the, the best of luck and success. And feel free to contact me uh, as you go out and look for owls in your neighborhood or study further owls that you've already seen. And I hope you can see some of my owl books behind me. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll Thank you. Share, share those uh, that resource list as well. And I uh, hope to see you soon at a, another virtual program. Good night. Good night.